So good afternoon everyone. I'm delighted to welcome everyone to the University Philosophical Society today on behalf of the Society and our senior patron, Dr. Provost, Dr. Patrick Prendergast. Thank you for joining us today to welcome the latest recipient of the Gold Medal of Honorary Patronage, Mr. Chile Ebo Usuji. Every year, the Council and members of the University Philosophical Society elect a select number of exceptional individuals to the honour of honorary patronage in recognition of their, accept their outstanding and significant contributions to their given field. We're absolutely delighted to be recognising Mr. Ebo Osuji's exceptional work here today. He was called to the bar in Nigeria in 1986 and shortly after went to work as prosecution and senior legal counsel on the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. After some time teaching in Canada, he then became the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Legal Advisor before moving to the International Criminal Court, where in 2018, he was elected to the presidency. He has become known and respected for calling out corruption and attempts to intimidate the judiciary and has stood up to Trump's administration's attempts to undermine the court. Chile Ebo Osuji is an internationally renowned academic, lawyer and judge and a firm defender of the rule of law and human rights across the world. It is our honour to grant him honorary patronage of the society today. Before we ask a few questions, I understand the president would like to say a few words. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, I am uh, deeply touched to, to receive this honor of a gold medal from the Phil. Um, as a second rate track and field athlete in my youth, uh, I could not win the bronze um, medal during the inter-house games in all the years of my high school, uh, but today I feel I'm um, uh, richly vindicated in my, one would say in those days, bookish uh, ways um, to have received uh, or to be receiving a gold medal later in life from this exceptionally storied society. And I must also say that <clears throat> the timing of it is, um, uh, the timing certainly makes it a special emollient that, that suits um, a soul that has um, endured much strain uh, recently. Some of you may be wondering what am I talking about? Well, the strain on the soul uh, comes not uh, so much that my, my tenure uh, the ICC is um, quickly approaching its end on the 10th of March, 2021, with all the uh, transitional anxieties that come with such major changes in life. The strain runner is, uh, it comes uh, more uh, from the relentlessly and extremely aggressive and unprecedented political attacks that have been directed against the International Criminal Court from the cabinet of uh, President Trump. The latest of these attacks was the imposition of coercive economic retributions upon the court's chief prosecutor and one of her aides for performing their legitimate functions on behalf of the court. Now, as an attack against the court, uh, for the explicitly stated purpose of coercing the court of its cause, the conduct in question mark the striking pedigree of absurdity in the possible abuse of sanctions regime that has been recognized in international law as a means of restraining or punishing entities and persons who commit or are uh, complicit in gross human rights violations, terrorism, drug trafficking, or threats to international peace and security. I'm extremely grateful for the steady deluge of condemnation that governments, organizations, and people of good conscience, many of them American citizens, have directed against this behavior and for their restatement of support for and faith in the court, in the circumstances. I am particularly grateful to the Irish government and the Irish press for their firm and unwavering position in this regard. 
For all those who have condemned these attacks against the court and who have restated their firm support for it, the ICC is an instrument for much good in the world. We must continue to see it as one of the tall pillars of the new multilateral international order, which the world wanted to replace the old one that proved entirely helpless against the horrors of World War II. Edmund Burke, a great Irishman, once delivered what stands out as the most famous creed for the need to stand up to evil. As he put it, we will all recall, but all that it takes for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing, unquote. And of course, that also stands true for good women too. The ICC is a key instrument through which the world seeks to actually do something against evil. It is at least an instrument of effective objection against evil. Ladies and gentlemen, the ICC has indeed effectively served to loosen the ugly grip of tyranny upon the spirit of our shared humanity. Now consider this. Since the creation of the ICC, there is seldom a day that passes without someone at the court receiving an email from someone somewhere else in the world complaining about an alleged circumstance of injustice that they labor under, which they hope the court could help remove. Some of these complaints, sadly, may not meet the threshold of gravity that is statutorily required before the ICC is permitted to intervene. In some instances even, some of these complaints come from people who may not know that that country is not a party to the ICC treaty, the Rome Statute, and therefore the court cannot intervene on its own in the particular situation. But the mere fact that these people look to the court to resolve their complaints, nevertheless, tells their story of hope. The hope that there is at last a place beyond their countries where they can seek justice that is denied to them at home. And that says a lot about the value of the ICC in loosening, as I put it earlier, the ugly grip of tyranny upon the human spirit. Many years ago, when I was serving as a prosecuting counsel at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, I was prosecuting a former mayor of a local government area near Kigali, and known literally as the Kigali Rural Local Government Area at the time, prosecuting him on charges of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. The defendant, Mr. Law Simanza, had been the mayor of that community for over 29 years until shortly before the Rwandan genocide in 1994. And when the genocide erupted, he rallied the notorious inter Hamwe militia men who were the infamous foot soldiers of that genocide. In a society with very weak or non-existent structures of rule of law, an all-powerful mayor of the Kigali rural local government area meant that the local population were left helpless against the whims and caprices of an abusive mayor. And to say that Mr. Simenza was an abusive mayor would be quite an understatement. Now, almost three decades as the mayor of the locality had the effect that many of the young adults in his community had grown up used to seeing him as a local strongman who dictated events in their lives. Very quickly in the course of the trial, I could not help but notice the psychological hold that he still had 
on them. I had to work hard against a perceptible reflex on the part of the, some of the witnesses to freeze once they came into the courtroom and saw him sitting there. Some of them even told me that they found it difficult to believe that he was actually standing trial, being required to account for his conduct, that he was no longer controlling their lives as he once did, and that uh, his own fate was now truly in the objective hands of judges of an international criminal court that was located in another country where he had no way of asserting overriding influence. Those witnesses represented the teeming denizens of the rural communities of the world where the clique light of global attention does not always shine to expose their operations for all to see. He took the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, a temporary international mechanism to convince those witnesses that the hands of tyranny, which the former mayor had represented, had actually been loosened from their lives by an international instrument of justice. The purpose of the ICC is to serve permanently for humanity everywhere in the world, the purpose that the ICTR served on a temporary basis for Rwanda. And I do insist that the ICC is making its mark in that regard. There are many ways to demonstrate that mark. One element of it comes in the manner of all those complaints we receive from around the world, from citizens complaining about sundry deprivations under which they labor. But perhaps the most emblematic demonstration of the court's values in is, rather, is the serious perturbation that the court's work has provoked in the predisposition of certain leaders of even very powerful states, such as tempts them to attack the court so aggressively. It is indeed very significant that officials of very powerful nations will see the ICC as their quote unquote, worst nightmare come to life. In other words, quote, a monster that must be slayed, unquote. It is of course correct to dismiss these descriptions as flights of truly overdone melodrama. Still, the significance of the underlying anxiety about the ICC and all that it stands for should not be uh, ignored. We also know that beyond the propaganda against the court, there have been many leaders who have expended significant funds and their own goodwill at that in campaigns to undermine the court. Why go through all that trouble unless you see the ICC as a real obstacle to your own I had occasion to share some reflections on the 27th of January this year on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. On the occasion, I offered the following thoughts. A guiding ethos of the new world order following World War II, which was called evil with the Holocaust, was engraved in the commitment of never again. It bears stressing, of course, that the Holocaust remains the paradigm testament of the human capacity for evil. As a global undertaking, however, never again was meant to stand against human atrocities of even lesser scale, so that humanity is never again to endure atrocity on the scale of the Holocaust. But there is always the question whether never again really meant anything. In the light of that question, it may be significant that in the decades following the liberation of our switch, the world witnessed other atrocities in the forms of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and yes, genocide. It was to take events like the genocide against Rwandan Tutsis and crimes against humanity committed in the former Yugoslavia for the world finally to take firm action that gives concrete instrument to the never again undertaken. 
the firm action was the adoption of the Rome Statute in 1998. And the concrete instrument is the International Criminal Court that was therein created. Now, as an actionable, an actionable undertaking, never again is indeed a defiant pledge. It communicates a promise of strenuous struggle against an opposing foe. The ICC is an actionable instrument of that defiant pledge, that onerous struggle against evil in our own time. It is in that light that the trenchant political attacks directed against the court oddly makes some sense. Of course, the ICC must be allowed to do its work undistracted by attacks directed against it. An obvious strategy to intimidate and coerce it to change cause from the path of justice. But it may well be wishful thinking to hope for an end to such attacks, and there is no readily available strategy to stop them, short of those occasions when a particular attack crosses the line into the territory of a distinct offense, a punishable under Article 70 of the Rome Statute. We are thus left to recognize the consolatory significance of these political attacks. And that is to say, it is in the nature of the ICC's mandate to attract such resistance as is inherent in the very nature of the arduous struggle that was always contemplated in the pledge of never again. And that resistance shows that the court is making a difference. It shows that the court cannot be ignored by those who may have an interest in the preference to leave innocent victims at the mercy of heinous crimes, or worse still, those who may be inclined actually to perpetrate such crimes. Yes, it is in the very nature of the courts to get in the way of such atrocities, to stand against them. And yes, it is better for the courts to draw the ire of uh, potential forces of these violations and of those who see an interest in condoning them than that their hellfire is allowed to rain unobstructed upon the defenseless innocent victims. Thus, some comfort may be taken in the realization that the political attacks against the ICC are a veritable signal that the court is doing its work as it should precisely by engaging in the very strenuous struggle that characterizes the foul of never again. From the perspective of the ICC, that vow of never again is a shared responsibility regarding which the court stands ready to play its own part. That part requires the court to put itself between the victims and the atrocities that the world had in mind when creating the ICC, even if it means brooking political attacks against the court itself. And for its part, the world must continue to support and nurture in the most robust way, that institution of accountability that it established as a monument to the actionable vow that the world would never again allow our shared humanity to endure genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression without effective objection. I directly urge everyone listening to me now to spare no effort in supporting this court that is one instrument through which you can hope to make a difference against evil in an effective way. We must protect this instrument with our own lives now, lest significant parts of humanity will lose their lives. And in a world in which we are no longer sure of the moral boundaries of political power, we too may even lose our own lives to the evil that the court was established to try and deter, if the court is not there to serve that deterrent purpose against those evils. That equation, of course, may sound dramatic to some, but it is that simple. Thank you.
Thank you so much for that wonderful defense of the of the court and something that you've become so known for. And obviously you've been speaking out a lot recently in defense of the court in response to those attempts by the United States and by Israel to undermine your authority. And um, the United States obviously objecting strongly to the investigation launched by the court in relation to alleged war crimes in Afghanistan involving some of their troops and Israel objecting to the court's attempt to investigate Palestinian grievances. How do you see the future of the court's relationship with those countries? And do you think there is hope for improvement? I do think there is hope for improvement. Because I know that in uh, those countries, uh, lots of the citizens uh, are of good faith and they do support the court. They, they value the court and they wish it well. They want it to succeed. Um, Let's take, for instance, the United States. Um, the, the US Congress actually uh, supported the creation of this court before it was created, right? So I believe it was in 1994, um, 1995. Congress adopted what they call the sense of uh, Congress, the US Senate, where they urged the US um, uh, government to support the creation of the International Criminal Court because it will help in making the world a more lawful place and in turn will um, result in benefit uh, for the United States. So the developments like that, uh, and they continue, some people continue to, as I say, to wish it well. As you know, um, the American Bar Association has been a very strong supporter of this court and has continued to support uh, the court through all these attacks, condemning these attacks and supporting the court. Uh, they too were um, helpful in pushing for the establishment of the court, one of the oldest um, uh, respected organizations, non-governmental organizations that, that pushed for it. And they remain uh, keenly interested in what we do. So I am hopeful that at some point, um, something positive would occur down the line. In light of that, I suppose, particularly in light of the US issue, I kind of wanted to ask you about Ruth Bader Ginsburg briefly. Like yourself, she famously refused to back down to Donald Trump and was repeatedly smeared by conservative media. I suppose implicit in the ethos of any international court is the understanding that where possible, justice should be done at home first. And then when all avenues for justice in that state have been exhausted and the issue is still not resolved, then and only then should the case reach international courts. However, if justice is being poorly administered at home, here I'm thinking about Trump stacking the lower courts with justices that he agrees with and trying to replace Ginsburg quite speedily before the election. If that kind of potential maladministration of justice is happening at home in a state, and meanwhile that state refuses to play ball with the International Criminal Court, what can be done to help the citizens of that state? Do you worry about the future of America's Supreme Court following Ginsburg's death? And I suppose more broadly, do you worry about its ability to cooperate with other countries and be held accountable? As you know, it will not be appropriate for me to comment on the process of the United States um, um, uh, nomination of a Supreme Court justice or what they do. I can also uh, say that um, uh, one can confidently say that uh, the United States has strong uh, rule of law that, um, you know, the floor said and done. Um, they're just some things we hope will not um, happen in that country. The, the greater difficulty, though, is the message that other countries that don't have a strong uh, system of rule of law may be taken from what's happening now, these attacks against the court. And that's where the, uh, the greater, in my view, concern truly, truly lies. If you have um, uh, dictatorships in all parts of the world who are looking at this and seeing it as a good thing, as a sign that a country that was known for strong rule of law um, um, uh, ethos, it now uh, think it's a good idea to attack a, a court of law so openly and so unabashedly saying, well, we are attacking this court because we want the court to change course. We are coercing it to stop doing what it is doing. Uh, you can imagine what that does to a lot of um, places around the world. I spoke, I gave the example of when I was prosecuting at the ICTR in the Kigali rural local government area, a place where, as I say, the big light of, of um, public attention does not always shine. Many places like that still 
as we speak. So you have local strongmen who believe, all right, yes, we can do this sort of thing to our local um, judiciaries. It's, all, it's an okay thing to do. Then we are in deep, deep trouble, and that's the greatest fear. And the value of the court was precisely to stand against that. That's what the international community wanted to do. They knew that that sort of behavior happened and they created the court to say, we are putting a measure in place so that if justice cannot be done at home, there's a place outside home where uh, people can go to seek justice. That is why the court was created. So that need, if you look around the world, the stories we read in the press in various parts of the world, that need remains as crucial as it was uh, when the court was created. Absolutely. I think then you can kind of tell when you think about those critiques of the ICC, I suppose they come across as quite conflicting. As on one hand, you can take the example of John Bolton of the US making what you described as an incendiary speech calibrated and calculated to boil the blood of American patriots an emotive demonization of the ICC, essentially saying that citizens need to be protected from the court, that it is somehow overly lit litigious, that it's somehow dangerous in some way. And then on the other hand, we have the BBC complaining that the ICC is unsuccessful because it hasn't made enough convictions, essentially that it's weak and it doesn't pose a real threat to those who commit acts against humanity. How do you balance those two schools of criticism? Because clearly the court can't be both dangerous and invasive and ineffectual and weak at the same time. Well, that's how those sorts of criticism, uh, criticisms cancel themselves out, you see. And so the, the, um, the, the, it remains the case, and I need to stress it, uh, you mentioned uh, Mr. Bolton's complaints that the reason why they could not trust the court is the court would be politicized and uh, so the argument being to uh, convict everyone that sentenced there because of political motivation. Don't forget those sorts of arguments have been made against other international institutions, uh, even local courts actually, uh, not only international courts as well, but uh, national courts where when judges do their work well, they're accused of uh, being political in, in the UK where, where we watched the, the debate about and the litigation on, on Brexit, where even some journalists um, uh, writing such bizarre things and calling judges enemies of the people. That sort of uh, stuff goes on. But um, the important thing is not to get distracted by them, to keep on doing what you must do as judges. Um, Court. And the cases we do, uh, necessarily political. They're necessarily political, not to say that the process itself is political, because when you're talking about um, genocide, for instance, they usually occur in the context of, um, you know, armed conflict in which um, there's internal political uh, difficulties back home, um, crimes against humanity, persecution, those sorts of things in the, uh, we did, as you recall, the, uh, the Kenya uh, cases, it was um, the case resulted from political uh, political process of electing a president of a country. So they are, we have those, but we don't let the politics distract us. And also we don't, when I say we don't let the politics distract us, not only the politics of what people want to see on either side of those political debates who are involved in them, but also in the results we give, we do not let the, um, the fact that uh, there may be outcry if we um, acquitted somebody. Uh, yes, let there be outcry, but if the evidence does not support the charge, we will acquit. And we've done that in the past. So that goes against the, the argument that the court is political and will, cannot be trusted. The, the is evidence does not support that kind of rhetoric. But also we cannot accept that um, the expectation that to convict any, everyone that's indicted in order to uh, count the number of convictions should drive the work of the law. That cannot be the case. Justice is done when People have gone through the process of accountability. That process of accountability itself is a process of justice. That process has the value, at least that there are places where people couldn't think that some strong men, usually these are men, could ever be brought to justice to account for their action. But then they see 
that person actually standing trial, be they president, as happened in the case of Kenya, or vice president, or mayor, or in the case of Bemba, a man who was in the position of president of uh, his, his some group. So that the strong men have been seen sitting in the dark, accounting for their action. That is justice enough. Uh, if conviction results from it, so be it. If acquittal results from it, so be it. But those kinds of outcomes cannot dictate how the court is viewed as a legitimate institution. Absolutely. I think so those, a lot of those criticisms of the ICC just actually share a number of characteristics with criticisms of the UN and the Court of Justice of the European Union and the International Court of Justice, those being that it's unavoidably very difficult to compel other states to work alongside each other or to submit to be judged by other states. You've quoted President Truman a number of times, who said in his first address to the UN that no nation wants war, every nation wants peace. The difficulty is that it is easier to get people to agree upon peace as an ideal than to agree on principles of law and justice or to agree to subject their own acts to the collective judgment of mankind. You yourself point out the unfortunate reality of international law, how ICC arrest warrants have been ignored in the past, how judgments of the ICJ and the European Court of Human Rights haven't been heeded and certain countries opt out of the end. Um, of international organizations when it politically suits them to do so. And international courts therefore have to operate in a very tricky political arena, struggling to be taken seriously and to be listened to, which is obviously a very difficult issue to meaningfully resolve. And I wonder in light of that, where do you think that unwillingness to work together as an international community comes from? Do you think it's inherent in our nature or do you think it kind of boils down to the dangers of nationalism and this belief therein that strong states should never submit to others or will never allow themselves to be bossed around? I think it's all of those. I think it's, it's, it's actually both. I mean, yes, of course, there is the uh, instinct for self-preservation. Um, the, it, it works in there. Um, the instinct, again, uh, risk aversion. Uh, well, if I'm going to be tried, I, can, I want to see the outcome. I like to see how this, all, how this thing works out. So if I don't see it, therefore, I'm, I'm nervous. I, I read it on the subjected to that kind of uh, risk process where the, the result uh, is 50-50. That's a lot of, the risk is too high. If what happens is either you're convicted or you're acquitted, there's no other option at the end of that uh, for the most uh, part. So you can see how that can lead to a reluctance for people to, sub to, to submit to, to, to justice. But that, of course, uh, cannot control um, what the international community does within ICC, because the same risk exists at the national level in courts in you know the domestic arena uh, also have that. But the, the difference is that um, citizens have no, no, there's no choice in the matter. The police will arrest you and take you to court. At the ICC, we don't have an effective police court that will do that. So, but that shouldn't matter. The, the consideration is that. Um, we have to focus on the needs of justice and insist upon it at all times. Now, also, uh, we recognize um, the instinct to, of people to feel better than the others. Um, and, and I call that the, the alterity, uh, otherness of uh, the human spirit, always wanting to single out somebody else as different and in the process of feeling somehow finding a reason to consider yourself as better than the other person. Yes, uh, well, why should I, you know, I'm superior to other people? How can I be held to account on the same standard? I should be treated differently. But we don't accept that proposition of the court. Absolutely. I think particularly when you consider those things in light of that, in light of that kind of political um, stuff, I suppose that the work of the ICC is always, always going to be political, as you've, as you've said, how war itself is a political act, genocide is a political act, crimes against humanity are often political acts committed by people who wield or seek to wield political power. Uh, not only that, you've spent your life obviously dealing with legal issues with geopolitical consequences, um, and you're very, they're obviously therefore very familiar with political threats and equally familiar with navigating that obvious, like obviously complex separation of powers. What would you say is the most important lesson that you've learned in your career about this struggle between law and politics? The, the most important lesson uh, uh, learned is that we cannot give up. Uh, the most important lesson is that 
these tendencies will always be there. As I said, um, even in the uh, most liberal societies, I, I practiced law in Canada, as you know, and um, it was often the case that when the Supreme Court of Canada rendered um, a judgment on the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, interpreting it in a way that uh, makes greater accommodation for people who have been disadvantaged in the past, uh, they'll be howling that the court being, you know, uh, you know, too activist and not that. So yes, there will be a tendency uh, for politics to always, um, you know, uh, um, be opposed to, to, to the law. But we must insist that um, law is there to restrain the excesses of politics. That is the whole point. And when that happens, it protects all of us, it protects all of us. Because those who are uh, complaining about the, the, the rule of law today may in future uh, be in dire need of it for their own protection. So we must insist that the victims um, of these atrocities cannot be left on their own. Uh, however, howling the, um, those who find an interest in doing so, however, uh, you know, harshly or mildly or a way to do it, uh, we must insist, no. Uh, victims of atrocities, remember here, we are talking about not just any, uh, any crime, talking about genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and crime of aggression. We have to stand firm to say, no, the law must be there to protect victims from these um, heinous crimes. Absolutely. You obviously have a very strong sense of protecting victims and the importance of the rule of law in doing that. But I wonder, as a prosecutor and as a judge, you've obviously dealt with some very bleak and, and dark subject matter and heard some harrowing stories from victims who have obviously experienced some absolute, like, unimaginable horrors, evil, as you say. And specific, I'm wondering specifically of your experiences investigating the Rwandan genocide and other sort of brutal crimes against humanity. How has seeing humanity at its worst sort of informed your understanding of and appreciation for the law? It has, it has, and that's um, um, uh, uh, oftentimes, you know, I mean, as a judge, I must, um, you know, be uh, careful to, to restrain passion, and that's important to do. Um, but the reality of the matter is after you've seen what um, human beings are capable of doing to one another, um, it sort of, um, should I say, forges your, your attitude towards what we are worried about here, what we're concerned with here. I, I, the Rwandan genocide, some may recall the video that was viral in 1994 of um, a woman walking along and a group of interham, where about two or three of them descended upon this woman and hacked her to death. It was recorded as if it was a piece of wood and there are other stories I, I, I came out of that experience with that, um, quite frankly, makes it difficult for me to accept the proposition that uh, the ICC, uh, we can afford the luxury of backing off from our job because we are worried that um, someone would freeze our bank account or make it difficult, make economic life difficult for us. Uh, you can't, um, for me, that's quite frankly unimaginable a conception to compare that kind of plight with the plight of people who suffer the fate of the kinds of conduct that the Rome Statute was put in place to prevent the genocide, the crimes against humanity, the war crimes. How can I look my children and grandchildren in the eye and tell them, well, I didn't do my job as my conscience dictated me because I'm afraid 
that somebody may say, well, my bank account was frozen. I mean, uh, well, uh, then. Absolutely, absolutely. I think in light of that then, I suppose, what, if anything, gives you hope for the future of international law and its reputation in the political arena and with those kind of things and, and how will it, will it will, what its legacy is going to be? I, I do think that there's, um, the hope must be in the world realizing in the surreal circumstances of today's life to ask themselves what were we thinking after the end of the Second World War from the period of 1945 and the following years. What were we thinking when we decided to establish the United Nations? What were we thinking when we decided to adopt the Convention Against Genocide? What were we thinking when we decided far back then, following the urging, the fervent urging of the President Truman you referred to earlier, to say, now we want to affirm the principles derived from the Nuremberg Charter and the Nuremberg Judgment as principles of international law. What were we thinking when we decided to explore the possibility and desirability as the United Nations um, resolution expressed it of establishing an international mechanism that will prosecute genocide and crimes against humanity after the Second World War. What was the world thinking then? Now, have those concerns, considerations, are they a thing of the past? If the answer is no, they're not a thing of the past, then the world will resolve itself and use the opportunity presented itself now, presented us, us now, to re-energize themselves against guarding up still those institutions and those ideas to say we are going to insist on a multilateral rule of law. We are going to insist that we're not going to go back to a regime where um, international law only concerned relations between states at a governmental level would not recognize human beings as bearing um, rights and responsibilities. We're going to insist that it's such a thing as a human right in need of actionable protection. We have to go back to thinking that and saying, for that reason, we're going to insist upon it, insist upon those principles and move forward. There may be states that may be expressing confusion now due to the waves of nationalism or other sentiments, but the broader international community will insist, must insist on guarding those gains of the period following the Second World War until such a time as those who may be experiencing some you know, confusion back home will rejoin the, the stream of um, acceptable thinking down the line. Absolutely, and I definitely agree. It's worth thinking back on those principles of the past, particularly when those principles are essentially eternal uh, to kind of give us hope for the future. I think, as finally, I'm going to I open the questions up to a few students. I just want to ask as a law student myself and on behalf of the many other law students watching this event, I would love to ask, what are your hopes for the up and coming generation of lawyers and judges? And what advice, if any, would you give to us stepping into legal practice in a world that's been rapidly and totally changed by COVID and political upheaval over the last few years? I do, do not get distracted by COVID. Um, uh, it will not be there forever. It is, um, it is trying for all of us. It's confusing for everyone, but don't get distracted by it. Uh, remain resolved that this world is yours, belongs to you. Uh, yes, the uh, people of my generation may be um, occupying the space uh, for now, but that space belongs to you in future. So uh, think of it, of it in those terms. You have a stake and interest in it. You have a right in um, a voice on how it should be. And um, the good thing now is that um, when I, there was a time in the past when I was younger, when it seemed like the opinion of younger people didn't matter much. But I think that has changed. No one thinks in those terms anymore, uh, even in one's home. 
uh, we must take the, the, the you know, we, we, you know, actionalize the, that old biblical saying, not only voices, so not only mouths of babes, wisdom can come. And that's the case for, you know, 10 year olds in the, in the families, let alone young people who are in the universities, current day law students. So the point is that the world belongs to you. Uh, nobody has a greater stake in it than you do, no greater right in it than you do. So you, you, you need to mobilize, demand what you want done, uh, make your views known. And, and we do take them seriously. We may disagree from time to time when people say, well, certain experience will tell us to, well, maybe think harder on this thing. But that's not to say those opinions are not taken into account. Oftentimes, they collide what with what uh, should be done or what adults may have thought about, may not have thought about sufficiently. Somebody else uh, reminds them of that. Uh, so it, it is sometimes they keep up the hope Keep trying hard, um, focus on you know, the career path you want to have. Uh, and this is now practical advice. If in the beginning, um, you know, because of the ups and downs of, of um, the economy, uh, and maybe periods of unemployment in the legal field and others, um, think about how else you can remain relevant, other things you can do to keep um, still relevant on your trajectory and um, uh, things, but do your uh, graduate studies, master's degree, PhD, is it if possible while you wait for um, opportunities to open up, those are never lost. Um, don't forget, uh, people will move off the stage. I will not be here all the time. I'm already I'm leaving in March. Uh, the fear new generation so that kind of rotation happens and before you know it you rotate and i used to be a young lawyer not too long ago at the ictr and here i am today so the same kind of future awaits each and every one of you mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. i'm going to look into some of the questions that you've been sent in by students and welcome anybody who's watching to probably any questions you may ask from them and from anything else that you have and um, somebody's asked and um, would somebody's asked what your opinion is about how feminism can curb Crimes against humanity, against women, or about or about fears of genocide or fears of war being used against women. You know, the, your 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 uh, there's some muffling of the voice. I didn't hear. Yeah. Sorry, the question was from a student who asked how they, how you think feminism can help curb those sort of crimes against humanity and tools of war that are used against women. How feminists can help? Sorry. How feminism can help um, curb the crimes against humanity and, and war crimes being committed against women. Well, the 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 um, the I think the um, for one thing the the need to uh, speak up against them is already a start and insist upon that. The um, I quoted Edmund Burke's um, well-known um, aphorism the beginning of my um, lecture, um, that all that it takes for evil to prevail is for good people to do nothing. Now, and let us not think that um, the task of doing something belongs to somebody else. No, uh, it has to be your seed. Okay, this is my task because if uh, that, that psychology that psychology that um, when somebody starts something it attracts others to it um, you know experiments done where you see someone lying in the street not being helped everybody walking what would walk past but once that first person stops okay what's going on here suddenly it pulls others in so it is uh, small steps like that. It may look like nothing, but they mean a lot. I mean, speaking out um, when there's instance of violence against uh, women, speak out against it and draw attention to it. Demand that it should not happen. Uh, demand that there needs to be um, investigation and prosecution, be it in a national setting or 
um, in other countries where these sort of things alleged to have happened, insist that your, your, your government leaders take action on behalf of you, something of the mobilized to have that done. Those are ways I can think of now to deal with that at the uh, individual level. Absolutely, it all, it all kind of comes down to, I suppose, like the normalization and the mainstream and putting feminism in the mainstream. And once that happens, those things become a bit tolerated less. And um, if anybody else has any questions, they're welcome to type them in. And um, yeah, we've one coming in here. Um, somebody writes in saying, when she went to The Hague, I went to watch the hearing of Dominic Ongwen in the ICC, and I was surprised by how casual the hearing seems to be. Do you think that due to the relaxed schedules and long processes that the proceedings are fairer and better compared to national courts? Well, I can't um, comment on casual and now, you know, how it was, I cannot uh, comment. One thing that you, again, I don't know what's meant by, by casual as well, but one thing we need to be careful about is uh, the, these trials are often long, the trials in the international sphere are often long. If anybody comes to court expecting, you know, fireworks, it doesn't work that way. There are times when the process can be, quite frankly, mind-numbingly dull. But in the process, uh, is the process of inquiring for the truth, um, to the extent that that is possible to be done, um, so um, that's it. So the the, work, uh, the, the judges in the Ongwen case I know to be very serious professionals, and um, so I would not so second guess the way they were conducting that trial. One thing, though, we must also keep in mind is the ICC is an international court. By that, it means necessarily that the lawyers and judges who um, do the work come from a diversity of countries, different backgrounds. And we have to be often accommodating, we have to be accommodating of uh, different ways of doing things. So as a law, common law lawyer, I learned quickly to uh, try and adapt to how colleagues from other places um, do their work, and they to me. Um, we also learn to be patient with one another. So there are some things you may be taking for granted because of your own legal, cultural background that others may not understand, right? Or that seems strange and you know to them. But it's these are sort of things we have to um, some of the features of the of the system. Absolutely. I think I'd say the last question before we run out of time, somebody asks, what do you think has been the greatest failing of the ICC? The greatest failing of the ICC, that, <laughs> there, there are many of them. There are many failings um, like any other human institution, any other court of law anywhere in the world. Uh, it is not at all a perfect uh, uh, system. So um, there was a time when, for instance, um, I mean, I cannot uh, speak any more about the fact that a lot of the uh, people who have been indicted have not been arrested, which is we don't have police force to do the arresting. We depend on states parties to do that. So that it's not failing on the part of the ICC. There have certainly been some failings. that have been criticized, for instance, about the length of time it takes to do cases. Um, that is um, up to a point a legitimate criticism, but one also has to remember that, um, I remember, was it Cardozo? Benjamin Cardozo, the famous US jurist, who said justice is not to be taken by storm. It is to be wooed by slow advances. Um, that's what he said. But I always say, well, that's indeed, but we don't want to um, be too slow about it. And they, they, you know, they, they, they pride me fall asleep in the process. <laughs> so we have to find a way to uh, 
strike uh, balance. So what we've done recently, and that's something that hasn't been done in any international court, is the judges agreed to adopt some you know, set of guidelines that should um, guide the, the length of time it takes, for instance, to, to write judgments. Uh, we're forcing ourselves to do that. It, we're the first international courts to do that. And there are indeed many national courts that don't have that kind of um, set of guidelines, um, but others do as well. So it's something we agreed to do to try and, you know, to improve the system. It's work in progress, that's all I can say, but I'd rather have it um, than none at all. When, the important thing to remember here is this, I would say, the, when the international community worked hard to adopt the Rome Statute, negotiated, adopted in, in, in the 1990s, they were seizing a unique moment in time that presented itself. It was unique because there was no other way. That was the first time it was possible to do that. So they immediately seized the opportunity and created the court. But in doing so, they knew that they were not creating a perfect system. They knew something, they needed to get it going. And then over time, um, they will, we will look at how to refine and improve it. I think we're doing that. Yeah, of course. Of course, every institution is flawed in that sense, but it's, it's worth kind of recognizing those things. We actually have time for one more question. I'll just leave it on a, on a kind of a lighthearted one. Um, somebody writes in, a lot of the people watching this will be undergraduate law students studying for their degrees. What were some of your own personal struggles when you were studying law as a student? What was my what? Sorry. Uh, the question was, what were your own personal struggles when you were studying law as a student? Personal stories? Or personal struggles or things that you found challenging? Well, struggle. <laughs> <laughs> First, those struggles. Um, um, there were quite a, a few of them. The, the <clears throat> I think the the um, most the, the 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 amount of work one had to do was quite heavy, but <laughs> that was it, itself a particular um, struggle. One also uh, worried about you know um, what the future may, may hold after all that, um, would you even get employment uh, after you've got the, the law uh, degree? Uh, those are, I would say, the, the primary ones. With all that work, all the swatting that needed to, to happen, to, to, would that be what is in the end that um, you um, gain full employment? So that, that, those are uh, amongst the, the big ones, I would say. I suppose you're living proof that you can kind of overcome those things because obviously there was employment out there waiting for you and you ended up having a long... Yeah, I hope for everyone then, you know. <laughs> as we all will, as we all will. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. We're delighted, we are so honoured to have had you and to number you amongst some of our honorary patrons of the past. Um, so thank you so much, everybody, for attending and thank you so much again for taking the time to speak to us. Thank you very much, Mayor. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mind yourself. <laughs>